We shall never surrender. One small step for man. I have a dream. Did all those famous people really utter those historic quotes, or has someone been playing jiggery pokery with the evidence? Professor Buzzkill sets the record straight on quote or no quote. Hello, it's Professor Buzzkill here with another episode about famous quotes. Lots of people ask me about the famous Abraham Lincoln quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Did he say it? Was it something taken from another source, as was his equally famous government of the people, by the people, and for the people quote? Lincoln had adapted government of the people from something written by theologian Theodore Parker. A great many people knew of Parker's work, so it was obvious to Lincoln's audience that he was borrowing the idea from that great thinker. But what about a house divided? Yes, Lincoln did say that. It was the basis of an entire speech that helped define his career as a national politician. Standing in the Illinois State Capitol on June 16, 1858, and accepting the nomination of the Republican Party to run for the U.S. Senate against Democrat Stephen A. Douglas, Lincoln opened his speech with a direct shot at the main question of the day, the future of slavery in the United States. He said, quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand, end quote. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. And then he went on to explain why he thought that the United States must remain whole. Now, again, like the government of the people quote, Lincoln borrowed a house divided against itself from a well-known source, the Bible. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verse 25, Jesus said, quote, and if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand, end quote. It was a phrase that had been used fairly often in political speeches and writings by Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan in 1651, by Thomas Paine in his 1776 Common Sense, by Abigail Adams writing to a friend during the War of 1812, by Lincoln himself in an 1843 speech, and by Sam Houston during the debate on the Compromise of 1850, which was one of the U.S. government's attempts to calm slavery versus anti-slavery opinion regarding the admission of new states. So lots of people would have known the phrase and its meaning. But Lincoln used a house divided in more sophisticated ways during his famous 1858 speech. I'd like to explain that to you but someone else recently explained it so much better than I ever could. That someone else, of course, was Dr. Heather Cox Richardson, who, during one of her Politics Chat Facebook videos, used Lincoln's speech to help explain the implications of the political divisions in the United States at this moment in our history. Dr. Richardson very kindly let me borrow that audio to let you hear a real expert explain the speech and its meaning. So here she is, and I'll be back afterwards to wrap up this episode. We all know Lincoln's House Divided speech because that idea of a house divided against itself can't stand comes from the Bible. And it was an idea, actually, that he had developed over a number of speeches. He didn't come up with it in 1858 when, when it became very famous. He'd been working at it. It's a Bible verse. But what a lot of people don't realize is that the reason he used the image of the house is because he was trying to explain how the enslavers who ran the Democratic Party out of the American South had come to take over the country. And what he said is, you know, it's like you see a bunch of carpenters and they're all working on separate things. So you got James over here working on something and you got Franklin over here working on something and you've got Roger over there working on something. And, and there were four carpenters he mentioned, and he said they, uh, oh, and Stephen, I'm sorry, and Stephen is one of the other ones, unless I said him. And they're all working in their own separate ways, and you're not paying attention because they're just doing their thing. And then they start to fit the house together. And you recognize that James, James Buchanan, the president who oversaw some of the, the major pieces leading up to the Civil War, Franklin Pierce, who forced through the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, Roger Tawney, who handed down the Dred Scott decision, 
And Stephen Douglas, who tried to convince everybody that it didn't matter if people had enslavement or not in their states or in their territories, because at the end of the day, none of that mattered so long as black people were enslaved and white people weren't. So those four men are, are operating in completely different realms and they're saying, you know, that they're focusing on different things. But if you look at what they're doing, they're piecing together the joints of a house. And so that house that they are constructing is going to be a house that is dominated by a few large enslavers who think they're better than everybody else and think the, thinks the law doesn't apply to them. And we are going to have a house that is either all dominated by a few, a hierarchy in which a few wealthy men rule everybody, or we're going to build a house in which everybody is created equal. And a house divided against itself between the, the, the enslaver's vision of a hierarchy in which a few people rule and the rest of our vision of a house in which everybody is created equal and has a right to a say in their government, those two things can't be compatible. So a house divided against itself cannot stand. But we can build a house based on the Constitution of the Declaration of Independence or we can suffer through what James and Stephen and Franklin and Roger have built over here. So the whole reason that he used that metaphor was exactly what I'm talking about here to say, y'all weren't paying attention when we got the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the Dred Scott decision and James Buchanan um, doing his thing and Stephen Douglas telling you all it doesn't matter. But you put all those together and you get the destruction of our concept of human self-determination. It is beautiful and it is elegant and it exactly mirrors where we are today. And that idea that people are waking up and saying, no, no, we actually quite like the idea of being equal before the law. And that really says nothing necessarily about people's racial prejudice, ethnic prejudice, sexism, classism, any of those things, because it buys into their own self-interest and says, you know, you might think you don't want your neighbor to be raided at Mar-a-Lago for hiding something, but you want to make sure that everybody is answering to the same rules. Because if he doesn't have to answer to the law, neither does somebody that you do want to answer to the law and you want those legal protections yourself as well so i remember when i think it was freddie gray was murdered in the back of a police van and talking to somebody who said well you know it's all the democrats fault because they're the ones who've made the the city such hell holes and i said do you want to live in a in a country where the police can be judge and jury and execution without ever having anyone go before a court. And he said, well, it's the Democrats' fault. And I said, do you want to live in a society where police can decide who lives and who dies? And he said, it's the, it's the Democrats. It's in the cities where the Democrats are. And I said, do you want to have our police determine who gets to live and who gets to die? Or do you want to do it through our system where there is a jury trial? And finally, he conceded it probably wasn't such a great idea to let certain police officers decide who got to live and who got to die and, who, and how justice would be meted out. And that's, I think, ultimately what Lincoln was talking about and what we're talking about in this moment. What kind of a world do we want to live in? And that's not, you know, I think sometimes that it's portrayed as being some kind of a kumbaya we care about everybody moment. And I would love the world to be that way. But it doesn't have to be that way in the sense that you really can appeal to people's self-interest. You know, if the police can murder Freddie Gray, they can murder you. And that's the kind of world, I think, that extremists who want to get rid of the concept of the rule of law, even here in the U.S., are willing to live with because somehow they seem to think that they will never be on the losing end of that. What's interesting about this moment is so many of us who in Lincoln's time, for, for example, or even before 1965, didn't get to have a say, understand what it's like to be on the wrong side of that equation, to be people who are not paid equally, to be people who are in danger of physical abuse or even death that would never be punished because, oh, that's just, that's a private matter. And one of the things that I found gobsmacking 
in the last several years was learning that at one point, President Nixon put his wife in the hospital through violence and journalists knew it and they didn't report on it because they believed that that was a private matter, right? So there are a number of us who know what it's like to be on the losing end of a system in which we are all not treated equally. And I think that that's a really important thing going forward in this moment because we have had voices after 1965. We are losing our voices now. And this is the one of the last moments we get to speak up and to say, no, 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 we quite like the idea that we're all going to be held to the same level because we know what it looks like when we're not. So that's, I think, what we are all experimenting with right now or examining right now is what kind of a world do we want to live in and figuring out how we make our voices heard so that we do preserve democracy. Well, you can't get a more sophisticated yet approachable analysis of that speech anywhere. And we're all grateful to Dr. Richardson for letting us borrow it. Please go to the blog post for this episode to find the link to subscribe to Dr. Richardson's Facebook Live videos, to get her Letters from an American via Substack, and to find links to her wonderful podcast, Now and Then, with Dr. Joanne Freeman. And also, go to our website, ProfessorBuzzkill.com, to follow us on all social media, to subscribe to our free newsletter, and of course, to support us on Patreon. Thanks again, and talk to you next time. 